So what I want to discuss is gauge formulation of axion. At the end of the day, the, the goal is to really um, um, sort of um, point out that there is this uh, very interesting formulation of axion which, with no reference to global symmetry, intrinsically coming from the gauge symmetry of QCD, uh, which, um, uh, yeah, should be paid more attention. And um, now let me nevertheless discuss what would be motivation for it. Of course, obvious motivation is always we want to have, and it's understanding. We want to understand what are the realizations of Axion, okay? Um, but there are also two other motivations, um, minimum. Uh, first, this uh, formulation doesn't exhibit any uh, type of what sometimes people call Axion quality problem or in other words, which is the same thing as simply calculability uh, problem of, of, of a standard Peche queen formulation of axion. Uh, so that's the main motivation. But there is also a, a huge motivation which uh, comes from gravity, from the S-metric formulation of gravity, okay? I will very briefly discuss this S-metric story because I don't want to devote too much discussion to it, uh, but just, just to, 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 to tell you why the axion is, and in particular, gauge axion is hugely motivated from this uh, S matrix formulation of gravity. So, um, so there will, therefore, I, I go pretty, um, um, I, I will have the short introduction. So, so what is gravity, first of all, right? So, uh, gravity, of course, starts from Newton. Already Newton had uh, understanding that there was a concept of messenger, okay? Now then Einstein uh, completes this, uh, this is a pointer, right? Yeah, so Einstein uh, completes it uh, with, um, as a, <laughs> I don't know which one, <laughs> um, in two ways. So nonlinearity, the gravity gravitates, and uh, also uh, relativity. That it's also relativistic sources gravitate, like light, for instance, and so on. Okay. Now. So in Einstein, um, uh, gravity is a perturbation um, on a, some background metric, for example, Minkowski. But in Einstein theory, in, in classical theory, essentially there is no preference to any background. So what, what Einstein is telling us is that as long as you can solve uh, classical equations, and you find a solution, you can use that as your background, okay? So Einstein doesn't have a concept of vacuum, okay? Um, but you can, you can use it as a background and do some kind of small perturbations on top of it. For example, gravitational wave. Okay, gravitational wave is a solu solution, perfectly nice solution for classical equations of motion. And so you can use gravitational wave as a background and do your physics, either classical or quantum, in this background and so on, okay? Now, uh, however, the things change when we go from classical to quantum theory, as they should, because quantum theory obviously is more powerful and more powerful theories are usually more restrictive, okay? And that's great. I mean, that's absolutely great. Now, in, in quantum theory, in quantum theory, what in Einstein would be classical metric is a expectation value of a quantum field, of a quantum field. Excitations of, of, of that quantum field, as usual, that those are quantum particles, okay? Now, by the way, this is a standard relation between classical theory and quantum theory. Quantum theory produces classical theory in terms of expectation values, okay? So, this is a, a, a field that, or a particle with excitations that are particles, which we call graviton. So, they, are, uh, they have spin two and mass zero. So, these are massless particles of spin two. So, that's what quantum gravity is. Um, now, therefore, uh, quantum gravity is a theory of this particle, okay? So now the question is, of course, when, you, when we are dealing with something, first we have to formulate the theory. Now, formulation of the theory is always complete, okay? Of course, uh, there may be calculational issues. I mean, there is no theory, even in, in, even in quantum electrodynamics, we don't know how to com do the computations or, or 1,000 loops because we, you have to resum and so on. But that's not the point. The theory 
has to be the, the formulation of the theory always has to be exact. Okay? Then, of course, you can do approximate computations in the theory. That's perfectly fine. And so the, 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 the only existing formulation of quantum gravity, of what, what, this, what quantum gravity is, a theory of a graviton, right, is uh, S matrix. Okay? Now, S matrix is organic to string theory, but here, this doesn't matter. I'm not hanging up on string theory necessarily. In string theory, it's made very explicit. String theory is a theory formulated as an S matrix theory. Okay? Now, the S matrix is a formulation. What is S matrix formulation? S matrix tells you that you have a vacuum, an asymptotic vacuum. You have in states and you have out states. So I should tell you what are the degrees of freedom that produce in states and out states. This is obvious in gravity. It's graviton, different graviton with different polarizations, different momenta, etc. And then out states. And then I have to give you a dictionary or, or a manual which state goes to which, and that's formulation of the theory. That doesn't mean that when I give you this, it's very easy to compute. Some of these computations may be involved, pretty involved, obviously, okay? But this defines the theory, okay? So therefore, um, S-matrix formulation requires degrees of freedom in and out states, and the rules of interactions among them. And this is, this gives very severe restrictions on the vacuum structure of the theory, okay? So essentially, uh, all the vacua that do not allow you to, to define time globally or define in and out states are any background that would be perfectly fine in Einstein classical relativity in quantum gravity is out, which is great, okay? So the quantum gravity tells you, well, among all possible vacua, the vacua can only be those that allow you to have this in and out states as asymptotically and globally defined time, okay? Now, these limits, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. No, in, in S matrix, the, the, yeah, the S matrix is all about scattering. So the way theory is defined, it is defined through scattering. Now, this by no means implies that every, to explain any phenomena in an S-metric theory, you necessarily have to solve a scattering problem. You can, but sometimes it's not useful. For example, if you want to find a planetary orbit, you don't solve scattering, it's much easier to solve the, the equations. But the theory is formulated in terms of scattering. Then in that theory, you do other types of computations. So, yes, so there is a theory, and it tells you that the space-time you can choose, but it has to be such that it allows the S-matrix formulation. The rest is up to you. Whatever you, you space-time you come up, it has to allow for S-matrix formulation. Meaning, for example, it has to have globally defined time, okay? And so, which, for instance, the sitter state, um, in, or, or any state that etern is eternally inflating, or, and things like this, they do not have. Even big, big crunch, cosmo and this kind of stuff. So therefore, this limits, this fixes the framework, okay? Now, we can come back to this motivation, now, okay? So I don't want to now enter discussions about this motivation. So one motivation is this. If you want to fix your theory to be an S-matrix formulation, this fixes the background essentially uniquely. It has to be Minkowski. So then your theory cannot allow anything like this. Any, any, any sort of, so it's Minkowski, okay. So what, so what, what background? Curved space time. No, curved space time is okay as long as it allows you asymptotic, I'm, we're talking about asymptotic, asymptotic uh, things. In between, many things may happen. That's perfectly fine, okay? But for example, this one implication, of course, of, of this is that immediately this tells you that uh, dark energy cannot be cosmological constant. So it should come from, from some new physics. I don't know, a scalar field that is, that, that is sloping away or, or something like that, but it cannot be a cosmological constant. Okay, now I don't want to enter in this discussion, this transparency I, I stole from a different talk, 
but uh, but okay, even there is even a there are arguments that first of all, this is true, but there are also some arguments actually interestingly imply this deviation of the equation of state. But okay, I, I don't want to enter in this talk. I mean, I'll be happy to discuss later. Okay, let's 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 go, let's come to the strong state problem now, right? So this has very important implications for strong state problem. This motivation. Okay, and then second motivation will open up when we discuss on, on the road. Okay, so what is, okay, what's the strong state problem, right? So in strong state problem, st in a standard way, we formulate it as, a, as, a, as an issue with the so-called theta term. Okay, so theta bar. So this theta term has two contributions: uh, initial theta and argument of the determinant of, of the quark mass matrix. Um, so you can add this term to the Lagrangian, okay? In fact, if you have argument of quark mass matrix has non-zero non argument through the anomaly, it appears anyway. But um, but at the end of the day, the ob phys physical observable is the theta bar. Now, the, of course, this FF dual, dual field strength, is a total derivative. It's a total derivative. It's an, actually, you can write it as an anti-symmetrized a field strength of a three form, and this three form will play an extremely important role in this discussion. Okay, so this is a, a so called Chern Simons three form. Okay, so A is gluon, gluon field, so A mu's are gluons, uh, T's are generators, and this is a gluonic matrix. Now, um, of course, FF dual is invariant, so it's an invariant field, field strength, gauge invariant field strength of this three form. Uh, if, in other words, in, under the QCD gauge redundancy, under which gluons transform, as usual, the three form shifts as it should. It, it shifts through an anti-symmetrized derivative of a two form. This two form is in one-to-one -one correspondence with QCD gauge transformation. Okay. Omega is the gauge transformation parameter. A is, is a gluon field. Okay. Now, as we know very well, theta is physical. We'll come back to this why it is physical. And uh, so, uh, in particular, the, an observable that theta can, can tell us about is um, electric dipole moment of neutron, right? And uh, the current bound on electric dipole moment of neutron translates as a bound on theta bar. Okay, and so, and we say, okay, this means that theta bar is very small. We live in a vacuum with very small theta bar, and, uh, and this is a strong CP puzzle. Formulated as a naturalness problem, okay? So, strong CP puzzle is a naturalness problem. Now, let's try to, let's have a closer look. Uh, so, so I will sort of, I'll try like this. I will try to gradually increase the level of technicality until I finally l will lose everyone probably. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, but at the moment, I, I, let's try to understand. Now, there is a beautiful language of a three form language, very powerful because it's based on gauge redundancy and usually gauge redundancy is extremely powerful. And uh, so we can use this language to understand very, in a very simple terms, why is theta bar physical? What does it mean, the physicality of theta bar? Of course, at this point, this is just a language. It doesn't rediscover anything new, obviously. Now the, um, now the theta is physical because there is a correlator, which we call topological susceptibility of the vacuum, okay? So there is a, one-to-one -one correspondence between theta, physicality of theta, and the existence of this correlator in the theory, which is a constant, okay? So this correlator is a constant. Okay, fine. But now notice the following thing, that this correlator, the fact that there is this correlator, and thereby theta, theta bar is physical, implies that, remember, the FF dual was derivative of this chern simon 3 form, okay? So, therefore, it implies that the correlator of two chern simon 3 forms 
spectral representation of this correlator, Kellen Lehmann spectral representation, necessarily has a massless pole. Okay, it has pole at p square equals zero. So in other words, this means that uh, because of whatever reasons, one obvious candidate are instantons, okay? Because whoever, con in other words, whoever contributes to this correlator, we know certainly that instantons do contribute into this correlator, but there may be other sources. There could even be some beyond QCD sources that contribute to that correlator. But whoever contributes to that correlator, what it does, it makes C, which initially we write it as simply as an operator, right, of chern simons as a composite operator. C contains a massless three form. That's what effective field theory uh, tells us, okay? And effective field theory in this case is extremely powerful because challenge lemar representation, of course, is extremely powerful. It captures everything. Also, this tells you that it is this pole, of course, then there are massive poles. Obviously, theory has a mass gap. QCD is a theory with mass gap. There are massive poles. But those do not matter for the vacuum structure, okay? As you can see very easily because all the poles that are non-massless, they vanish in zero momentum limit. So the vacuum structure is entirely determined by the massless pole. And this is an extremely powerful handle because this tells you that you can do what, there can be in spectrum, there can be whoever you want, but the, vac the QCD theta vacuum is, is there because there is a massless three form in the theory, okay? Now, now the massless three form is restricted by gauge redundancy, okay? And now we can immediately see where the theta vacuum are, vacuum are coming from in the language of this massless three form. Because suppose you integrate out, so, suppose, so you have this theory, right? And in this theory, you want to find the vacuum structure. So integ you integrate out the theory, you do exact computations, let's say, or I don't know, or your friend is, is, is telling you what, what is the effective theory, doesn't matter. So the effective theory will be a, an algebraic function from the field strength. This is the same thing as FF dual, right? Because remember my notations, E was the same thing as FF dual originally, or in the original theory. But then E is, the, uh, is, is now a field strength of a massless one, okay? Um, so you have, uh, you have uh, a, al an algebraic function, and then you can add, you, here you will have infinite number of high derivatives, okay, infinite number. Now, this algebraic function uh, is only known in dilute instant on gas approximation, or also in chiral perturbation theory. Yeah, we know that form, okay? So, because it translates into the, uh, vacuum de de dependence of, of energy on theta bar. But you see how powerful is the three, four argument because actually you don't need to know this function. So there is some algebraic function plus infinite number of high derivatives. Now, high derivatives you can throw away because they do not contribute. They come from the integrating out massive poles and they never contribute into the vacuum structure. That's an exact statement, okay? So vacuum is entirely defined by this algebraic function, whatever it is. Now you want to solve for the vacuum. What you do, you do variation with respect to C, and the equation, vacuum equation, is extremely simple. It's, it's derivative of a derivative of this function with respect to E must be zero, okay? This means that irrespectively of the form of this function, the vacuum supports a constant, right? So it supports an arbitrary constant E. So, okay, so in the vacuum, you have expectation value of FF dual. So here again, there is this dictionary, right? So, and that's, these are the theta vacua. So theta vacua, literally, these are vacua with different expectation values, constant expectation values of the uh, E or FF dual, whatever. Okay? 
Now, if you want, if you think in terms of electric field, this is like an electric. So this E FF dual plays the role of the electric field, electric in the quotation marks, for the Chern-Simons three form. Okay. Now Chern-Simons three form it has three indices, so it's not a vector. It's a three form, but that's the way the electric form is 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 defined from a from a three form. Okay. Now this electric field is Lorentz constant, it's Lorentz invariant, obviously, doesn't break Lorentz symmetry, but it is CP odd. So it breaks CP, but not Lorentz invariance. So these are the celebrated theta vacua. Now, already from this discussion about the three form, you can understand that this theta vacua, they are not degenerate. They have, in other words, the energy of the vacuum depends on the theta parameter, okay? Now, this is, of course, in the standard language is well known. This is, this is actually, uh, it, it starts with Wachow-Witten theorem, which shows that the global minimum is always at theta bar, theta bar equals zero, okay? Global minimum among these different sectors of the theory. And now, these, these sectors with different values of the electric field, they do not talk to each other. They're, they are belong to the different super selection sectors, okay? Because there, are, there is no object that is sourcing this, this field in pure, in pure QCD, and that's why you cannot change the value of this field by any process, either classical or quantum, okay? And so this, but among all possible sectors, the minimum is at theta bar equals zero. Now, this is of course, uh, up until now, this is very general, this has nothing to do with the symmetric formulation or whatever. But now, of course, if we superimpose on this an S matrix formulation, if you demand that the vacua in the theory must be all S matrix vacua, you get something very interesting. You get a requirement that theta vacuum must be unphysical. In, in fact, the, the only physical vacuum must be theta bar equals zero. In other words, why? Because fine tuning will not help you. Because if you fine tune, let's say initial conditions of the universe or something, and you say, okay, we happen to live in theta bar vacuum, theta bar equals zero, that will not save the theory. Because if the, the same theory predicts other vacua, which are not S matrix vacua, this theory cannot be coupled to S matrix gravity, okay, formulation of gravity. So we already get, are getting something interesting, which says that somehow, in order to couple consistently QCD with S matrix gravity, okay, uh, theta vacuum must become unphysical. In other words, the, 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 the axion, is imposed upon us by this requirement of S matrix formulation, okay? What, what is about this? No, I, I told you, I don't want to enter there. I don't think S matrix is a hypothesis. You can treat, treat if you want as S matrix formulation. Uh, okay, first of all, it's a fact. We don't have any other formulation of gravity. That's what I was saying. But, uh, but if you want, you can take this not a, my st as a starting point, but it's only a motivation. If you don't like S-metrics by some my mysterious reason, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Yeah, we can put it aside. We can come back to this S-metrics discu discussion, yes. Could you say again why uh, line this S-metrics No, that's the thing because um, because you see you have a theory, and and theory as QCD is you define this theory somewhere up there. That's your fundamental uh, theory is a fundamental definition. The theory once you you come from that theory, theory has vacuum structure. It's no longer up to you. Theory tells you that it has this vacuum structure. Now. What you're gonna do with this vacua, of course, at best what you're gonna do, you somehow postulate that by some luck or some cosmological uh, 
evolution or some initial condition, we somehow ended up in, in the vacuum with one of the vacua, one among many, okay, which has the right properties from the point of view of, let's say, whatever is your requirement, S matrix or whatever. But this doesn't eliminate the other vacuum. Okay, so this is, this is the, the, the point, because you cannot just, you cannot select, you see, the, 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 the important the deep point is that theta vacua, they are not about selecting different theories. This is selecting different vacua in the same theory. Once you accept the theory, you have to accept that there are theta vacua, and then there must be some mechanism which makes them unphysical, okay? All right, so this is, this is very important, this, the, this point. And then, of course, this, 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 this motivates the axion, yes? Absolutely, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Exactly, yeah. This is precisely the point, because this is precisely the point. And by the way, this, um, okay, this, yeah, this can be source of some, 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 some philosophy, uh, also in beyond that. But what you are saying is absolutely correct. So, for example, if I have a theory, I don't know, in that theory I have a parameter, okay? Whatever, let's say, I don't know, a, a top, top, Yukawa coupling of top quark, right? Yukawa coupling of top quark is a parameter in the standard model. So standard model is not a theory for Yukawa coupling of a top quark. And then, if you discover that for certain couplings of top quark theory doesn't make any sense, then you say, okay, look, this is a very good selection criteria for me to discover these parameters. Top quark, the Yukawa coupling of the top quark at the level of the standard model is not a solution of the theory, okay? It's, it's a parameter of the theory. So when you select Yukawa coupling of top, you select the theory, okay? That's not true for theta, because theta is a solution. Of course, you can initially include theta, whatever you want, right? But in theory, theta is an expectation value of, a, of, an, of an electric field. You are getting it by solving the equations. You see, the vacuum equations, as I wrote, this is the vacuum equation, right? So it's no longer up to you which theta you want to use. This, this theory offers you all possible thetas. Now, of course, you can, so you can, from there on, from this point on, you can say, well, there may be some deep selection mechanism now, which among all possible solutions selects the one and somehow eliminates the others, which are unphysical. <laughs> that's the axion. So the theory tells you, okay, take axion, that's what it does. Okay, precisely. So why look for some other mysterious principle, which I don't see how it can exist, because theory gives you a solution. It's like saying, I think in the following way, I don't know, if I take Maxwell theory, right? If I take pure Maxwell without any electric charges, in pure Maxwell there is a solution with constant electric field, right? Uniform electric field. I mean, it, it is there, so we, so, now, there is a good reason why we don't see constant electric field in the universe, because they're mobile charges, and they eliminate them. On the other hand, we do see magnetic field in the universe. Okay, it's not precisely constant, but you, we do see, because there are no magnetic monopoles that could el eliminate it so efficiently. So, yeah, so in other words, what, what I'm saying is that this motivation, again, I've said this is motivation, we can come back to the motivational part, okay? But this, this motivation, it, it, it strength, strengthens the case for axion enormously, okay? No, it's a par No, no, not really. I mean, you cannot really. No, it's always an integration. There's always a part which is an integration constant. It's a, it's a part. To what? It's a parameter. Right. Which is according. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, because well, it, as you, uh, yeah, yeah. But as you know very well, probably better than me, that unimodular gravity is precisely gravity with the with the three form. So then you are changing. Yeah, because you are changing the theory. You. No, 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 no. This will be so. In other words. If you are saying that I can offer a theory in which, so what I'm trying to say is that, I'm trying to say that in QCD you don't have a choice. In QCD, the, 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 the theta is arbitrary and it's a solution of your theory. No, because you, no, already in the standard formulation, theta is a choice of your vacuum. Your theory offers you, so, Theta is a label of a vacuum in a given theory. I understand because yes, because that's the, yeah, that's precisely what I'm saying. Because that's why if I ignore gravity and stuff, there this may become sort of philosophical debate sometimes because you say, okay, look, because this vacuum obeys super selection rule, maybe it's also okay to call them a call theta a parameter because after all there's not much difference whether to call it a parameter or, or call, call it an integration constant etc cetera, etc cetera. okay so yes that's why that's why for me gravity as a motivation is important because gravity doesn't want to have anything else other than other than one special uh, case with minkowski vacuum but again, this is, as I said, I don't want to get stuck with this motivational part because it will change nothing for this gauge formulation of axion, but it's just to, to make it clear what, what, what one motivation for it, okay? In the massless QCD, you mean the, the, with the massless quark? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you have an axion. Who is the axion in that case? In the prime is the axion, yeah, that's exactly the point. Right. So in the QCD with massless quark, you have an axion for, as a bonus. Theory gives you an axion in form of eta prime, right? Well, because they, they are non-degenerate. So if you, if you choose one to be Minkowski, then others for sure will not be. Because they, they, that's Waffavit and the pro already from Waffavit and it's obvious. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, in the standard model, what a bit doesn't apply because you have the CKM and the axon doesn't relax at a certain T0. Now, is this compatible with the smart and No, no. In the standard model, so the so we'll get there and the, precisely about this, um, you know, axion quality. This is this concerns the quality, axion quality question. Okay, so in the standard model, but okay, I, I, we, can, we can answer in the first approximation. So in the standard model, you, you, if you compute electric dipole moment of neutron, there you have two contributions. There is a contribution which is theta bar contribution. That's what axion kills. But then there is an additional contribution, which is non theta bar contribution. That, of course, axion doesn't kill that. That is not a theta vacuum contribution. That's an additional contribution because of CP violation of the standard model. So that's yeah, absolutely, that's absolutely correct. That will be a, a crucial part of this. But let me let me move on. Okay. So let me. So now one way or an, another. Okay. If you so let's for a moment put this as matrix aside, and okay, we we, we want to have axion. Okay. Uh, you want to have axion either because of Naturalness issue, and you don't care about this matrix, or as a, as, a, as a consistency issue, as a consistency point, okay? Now, what Axion does, uh, Axion eliminates theta vacua, right? In the standard language, Axion eliminates theta vacua by uh, relaxing, promoting into a dynamical variable, which is Axion. Now, this is effectively what, this you can translate as sort of hixing of um, axion of, of three form. So in other words, what happens here is that the pole, the pole at p square equals zero is removed. Okay, this pole is removed. And uh, so, 
Theta bar is unphysical. But now we come to this point precisely that uh, what is sometimes called the axiom quality problem, okay? Because in order to fully eliminate theta bar, the um, axiom shift symmetry must be protected, must be exact, modulo to the QCD anomaly, okay? And uh, many people don't like this, and they have a point, obviously, because the point is, okay, so you say that there is an issue with theta bar. Okay, fine, then you introduce this new degree of freedom. But you require that this global symmetry, which has to be explicitly broken anyway by the, by, the, uh, by the anomaly, but miraculously is not broken by anything else, okay? Indeed, in the Peche Queen formulation, of the problem, this is, it's very hard to, how can we understand this, okay? Because in Peche Quinn formulation, the axion is a phase of a, of a scalar, and uh, there is a global symmetry, which acts as a shift symmetry of the axion, and axion is not protected against this shift symmetry. No protection, because you can deform theory, and here it's very important, because what happens is that you can continuously deform the theory without changing anything in, other than just this small deformation, and you can continuously change your predictions, which means that you are no longer having any predictions, right? Because you can have operators which do not respect global symmetry. Now, there have been many discussions, uh, arguments that these operators, they emerge, they can emerge from, uh, okay, the wormholes, et cetera, et cetera. But here, uh, even that is not the point. Simply what, 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 is, what is worrisome is that your theory allows to be continuously deformed and change your prediction. There is no principle that protects these deformations, okay? It protects the theory about these deformations. So basically, uh, it, therefore, theta in this formulation, axiom formulation, is essentially uncalculable. Because as I said, it is sensitive to arbitrary deformation of this theory. Now, of course, this also, again, as I said, if you take S matrix as motivation, this is in direct contradiction with the S matrix because such a deformation reintroduces theta vacua, of course, also, right? But as I, as I said, even if you don't care about the S matrix, this is the, this is the quality problem. Now, now I come to this point that this, for precisely this favors this uh, gauge formulation of axion, okay? Now, the, what is gauge formulation of axion? It, this is something incredibly simple because what you do, you, you, we have QCD, okay? Now, so in QCD, when we do gauge transformations, the Chern Simons three form shifts. Okay, so now, what you do, you postulate that there is a one single degree of freedom in low energy theory, okay? But introduced in form of anti-symmetric anti two-form, uh, so-called Carl Bramon type field, which has a corresponding gauge charge, okay? So you simply give a gauge content of the theory, that's it, that's all. That's it. You don't need to do anything else. You can just sit and watch, and theory is doing its job, okay? Because everything is controlled by the gauge redundancy. I will go in more details in this. As I said, I'm, I'm going into increasing level of technicality, but for, for, for those that maybe do not care about technicalities, is that why is this interesting? Because in this formulation, um, axion comes as an intrinsic gauge 
degree of freedom of QCD. You are not postulating any new gauge symmetries. You are not introducing, at no point you need to refer to U1 global or any global symmetry. Only the gauge structure. So then, in this theory, theta bar is unphysical, okay? So which means that there is no contribution to the electric dipole moment of neutron from, uh, from QCD. Now, so basically what happens is this, that the moment you postulate this, there is a, the, the Lagrangian is determined, okay? Uh, because it, the, 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 the B only enters through this combination, okay? Gauge invariant combination. And that's the end of the story, okay? So in other words, what happens is that this is a, literally a Higgs effect, okay? It's no longer some kind of Higgs type effect, but now we are dealing literally with the Higgs effect of a three form. Because what happens is that B becomes a longitudinal component of a massive three form, okay? And it's eaten up by a three form. Now, in this theory, we'll do this later, a little bit later. So in this theory, axion is, um, theta bar is unphysical, two, or, two all orders in operator expansion, not in perturbation theory. Two all, exact, this is an exact statement, okay? So there is no deformation, continuous deformation of this theory, which would regenerate th theta bar, okay? So theta bar is exactly zero. So as I said, here axion, B mu nu axion, becomes literally a longitudinal component of a massive three form. Now massless three form is a inter very interesting object. So it's massless, meaning that it does produce long range correlators, so that's why. But at the same time, it doesn't have any propagating degrees of freedom, okay? so. And um, the massive one, it has one propagating degree of freedom. So it has to eat up axion, it has to eat up a degree of freedom, an anti-symmetric form, in order to get a mass, and this is what is happening. So exactly in the same way as in ordinary Higgs effect, a, a Goldstone boson is eaten up by, by, by the gauge field, here, B mu nu is eaten up by the, by the Chern-Simons, by the three, ma massless three form in, Chern in Chern-Simons, uh, three form, that lives in Chersavans three form. And so what happens is that, of course, the, the pole at p square equals zero is, is, is shifted, is removed, and, and so now, the, now we have a, okay, no theta, no theta bar, no, no physical theta bar anymore. Yeah. It, that's a parameter of the theory. So, of course, axion theory does need a parameter. It is one parameter, which is the strength of the uh, axion interaction. Okay, the axion decay constant. So, we, so this parameter is not determined by QCD. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's, theory has one parameter, one free parameter, which we can only constrain phenomenologically. Okay, or through gravity. Okay. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, of course. The canonical normalized, yeah, yeah, right. The canonical normalized B, yeah, of course. The, the, you need a dimension. You, you need a scale. So theory tells you that you need a scale. You cannot just not not, in, not include it. Yeah, right. No, from from that point of view, it's it's the same as in Pache Queen. You you do need a scale for for the axion. But uh, you, you can see it immediately, and we, we can, we can I will come back to, to a little bit in, in more technical discussion here, so that you can see immediately that you, you write this, and there is no way, there is no possibility to deform a theory in such a way to get any non-zero electric field in the vacuum. It's very simple, because the, the, what Axion did, it put the, the, the three form in the Higgs phase. And that's it. If the, if, if the three form is the Higgs phase, you can never have any constant, any non-trivial vacuum structure because it's, there is no massless pole in the theory, period. Just like in the ordinary Higgs phenomena, W and Z are massive, 
you cannot have non-trivial vacuum, non-trivial electric field of W or Z in the vacuum because they're massive, okay? And um, so the, the same is happening here. Yeah, this is what I'm writing here. I mean, this is what is written here. This is pre uh, yeah, later, uh, yeah, yeah, later, it will come later, yes, more, more. Okay, so now, uh, again, I don't want to, this, this, to take from the, from, the, from the main discussion, but again, if, if, you, if we convolute this with, with the fact that if we assume that this is motivated by gravity, as I said, this is motivated independent of gravity because of this action story, but uh, if, if, you, if this is what you need to embed it, then yes, then it's, then it's very different because you see both, um, both um, Peche Queen and uh, this axion, they, uh, eventually they have to be embedded in the uh, above quantum gravity scale. And um, of course, in, that, in both cases, this is necessity. The Peche Queen um, UV completion offers a temporary sort of window in form of a scalar, but it doesn't offer a true UV completion, obviously. And so in Peche Queen, FA has to be below the quantum gravity scale. And here, this, is, this scale has to be around or above, okay? Now, of course, we don't know what quantum gravity scale is, and therefore, um, yeah, therefore, the, you don't really predict a number here. Now, what is the prediction before I come back to the, this uh, more, uh, more, more illuminating discussion? Of, so the advantage is calculability because this predicts theta bar equals zero and correspondingly, um, now, as we said, there was this question, right? So within the standard model, there is additional contribution coming from electrovic sector to the electric dipole moment of neutron and um, However, that contribution is, is, is much smaller than any experiment that is in the foreseeable future is offering us to measure electric dipole moment of neutron. And correspondingly, therefore, this gauge axion um, formulation tells you that if you see in the near future uh, any sign of electric dipole moment of neutron, that can only come from beyond the standard model physics because it cannot come from theta bar, okay? Yeah, whatever, you see, all the contributions are theta, but that the ones that are you can translate as contributions to theta, those are nullified by, this, by the axion, okay? Because topological susceptibility is, is nullified. The, the, what remains is only the contributions which you cannot, you cannot translate as contributions coming from the theta bar. Well, for, you are talking about standard axion. Let's not yeah, confuse. Okay. So here I'm talking about B menu. B menu always kills the topological susceptibility of the vacuum, no matter what. So all the contribution, therefore, which is translatable as contribution coming from theta bar of, of QCD, in other words, any contribution coming from the QCD vacu vacuum structure here is killed, okay? And of course, there, you can have other contributions to the electric dipole moment of neutron. You do have in the standard model contributions that could not care less about uh, QCD vacuum structure. So those are there, obviously. Right. Yeah, sure. To, for axion field, because you can have that pole. That's what I'm coming. At. Here, you cannot generate any that pole. It's a gauge symmetry that tells you that. Yeah, in the gauge formulation of axion, it's end of the story. Theta bar is identically zero, okay? So this is a real difference? Of course, of course, absolutely. That's, that's precisely the point, yeah. It can be tested. Well, tested, uh, yeah, in this way, right. Right, but this is the key point. Uh, 
if you have a ax standard axion, right, yeah. Yeah, because you can, yeah, in the axion is, poor axion, that's why, yeah, poor axion is susceptible to anything, right? I don't know what you mean on the equal zero. There is some minimum that axion has, right? So the question is whether in that minimum you kill the contribution that is proportional to theta bar or not. Here you cannot. Okay, probably this, this yeah, probably this will answer that. Yes, because of the standard, yes, this is what I'm discussing here. Let's follow this story, okay? So it's, it's written here. Okay, so let me now make it a little bit more, more te okay, more technical, sort of. Now, as I said, there is no axiom quality problem, and let us compare the two formulations, okay? Now, I'm, I'm trying to deconstruct the standard Pacheco-Queen to bare, literally bare essentials, okay? So I'm taking QCD with theta term or theta bar, whatever. Um, and um, okay, I'm introducing only one quark for simplicity, okay? Well, you can generalize to any number of flavors. And uh, so I'm coupling the standard Pacheco-Queen axion to this one quark. And um, so this is, this is the formulation, right? So I have f quark psi. I have phi Pacheco-Queen field, complex scalar, with the potential that gives expectation value to phi. Now, now I'm adding a deformation term. Now this deformation term could come w whatever source you want, okay? It will, it will become clear, yes, yes. Let's follow this story, yeah. So here, I'm, I'm, I'm maximal general. I'm saying you have terms that pre respect your U1 Pacheco-Queen, plus you can add, set, deform your theory by operators that do not. That's all I'm saying, okay? All right. Now, I chose this operator just to be quadratic, just to make the point, that you, you can even deform it at the quadratic level. Okay, so now, so there is a complex scalar, uh, Pacheco symmetry acts as a U1 transformation, as it acts chirally on fermions. And it's broken by this term. Now, let's, if I now write down, plug this there, take into account anomaly, and write down an effective theory of, of axion, I will get the following structure. So there is axion. Axion through the anomaly couples to E, to this E, right? This is this usual anomalous coupling. Okay. And um, now, for simplicity of illustration, instead of keeping around general K, uh, I chose simplest K, which is quadratic. Now, by the way, the dilute instant on gas approximation, which gives a famous cosine potential, that gives you K of this form, okay? But I'm taking K to be E squared. So you have this theory, okay? And plus explicit breaking term. Now you see what is happening in, in this story. So we write down equations in this theory, okay? So equations are very simple. So this is derivative of E is proportional to derivative of the axion. And then E enters as a source for the axion, okay? And the, now, the first equation you can integrate easily. And here comes the, the point about that there is an integration constant emerging in this term A0. So this A0 parameterizes whatever you want, okay? So you can choose this A0 as you want or make it simply arbitrary. So it's an integration constant. Now this integration constant can include co can some contributions that are calculable on top of whatever, okay? But on top of that, there is this arbitrariness entering here. Okay, so now, now you take this and plug it back here and you have this equation. 
And you see it very easily. So the axion minimum of the axion potential is at A0, but it, it is disturbed by the explicit breaking term. Okay, so without this explicit breaking term, it would be at A0, and it would effectively make electric field zero, because A would be A0, and electric field would be zero, okay? Or axiom would be at zero if you want. But because of the explicit breaking contribution, the, you can no longer can cancel the CP violating field. And so, as you can see, this is proportional to the explicit breaking. So it's proportional to two things. It's proportional to the A0. Here we come. In A0, you can have calculable parts coming from whatever physics, plus uncalculable parts. Uh, and so there, you see, that there is a double blow on E. As soon as you make it explicit breaking slightly, you get this, okay? Yeah. But QCD doesn't break axion shift symmetry. So oh, sorry, yeah, QCD. Sorry, sorry, yeah. <laughs> so of course, yeah. 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 It will translate CP violating operator if it doesn't break shift symmetry. If it does not, then it will necessarily translate into change of a zero. Okay, but still it's different from zero. Yeah, of course it can be different from zero. But then the point is that that will not preclude electric field to vanish. Okay. So, but of course, yes, if the, so the operators that can generate E are only the operators that explicitly break shift symmetry. Okay? I, I don't see any clash, but. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, of the axiom. But I don't understand. I mean, unless you break Peche Queen symmetry explicitly. I mean, I don't understand. If there is a look, if Peche Queen, imagine that Peche Queen is unbroken. Okay? Whatever contribution you can have, I can always redefine theta. It's unphysical. That's obvious. I mean, any contribution that is physically observable has to somehow, indirectly or indirectly, break patch queen symmetry. Otherwise, you have a symmetry and you just rotate it away. But it has to be, when I take uh, explicit breaking of QCD to zero, it has to vanish. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's what I'm saying, yes. Right, and that comes from this A0. That's precisely what this expression is telling you. This is what precisely this expression tells you. A0 encodes explicit breaking by QCD. If that vanishes, nothing happens. Then we agree, of course. But what I'm saying is that the, on top of when you generate the, 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 the when you have mu non-trivial, explicit breaking of QCD becomes physical and observable. Okay, that's the, that's the point. Okay, so let, let's go to the gauge. We, we can come back to this, of course. I'll be very happy to talk more about it. Okay, so now let's go again, have a look at this story with Hixing, right? So now, in gauge formulation of axion, what do we have? We have uh, three form shifts as, as, as anti-symmetrized derivative of a two form. Uh, sorry, am I over time? I'll finish soon, yes. Uh, so, right. Very good. So uh, now we shift anti-symmetric reform with this. And then there is a, of course, this is a, this is a postulate. Now we're defining a theory. So now we have a theory. I, I assume that there is a degree of freedom which knows about QCD gauge symmetry, gauge redundancy. OK. Then this automatically fixes that the only way B mu nu can enter in the most general effective Lagrangian is as a Stuckelberg of 3, 4.
And, uh, and this puts the three form in the Higgs phase. Now, we can see, as I said, we can see this for, for, from most general EFT. You can write down most general EFT. So you write down most general EFT, and then the equations of, you can add whatever operators you want, arbitrary, as, as long as these operators respect gauge redundancy, well, they should, they must. The equations, as you can see very easily, never have a solution with E equals constant other than zero, okay? So, in other words, E vanishes identically Uh, two all orders, I mean, uh, not even two all orders, it's, it's an exact statement, okay? Now, here it's very transparent because, it's very simple, because, the, because there is a gauge redundancy, this gauge redundancy is carried only by B, and therefore B acts as a Stuckelberg for, for, for C, and the two form a massive mode. And they always enter in this combination. There is nothing else. You can have high derivatives, etc. cetera, uh, edit on top of it, no, 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 no issue. And um, so yeah, I mean, every, every, every contrib Sorry. every contribution that is, you can, that can come from other sectors of the theory, yeah, reduces to some generating some high dimensional operators. I mean, high, some not necessarily high dimensional, whatever operators. Whatever operators, but again, as I said, by gauge redundancy, this, there is no way to, um, there is no way to um, unhix the three form. Again, I mean, this doesn't mean that Ah, yeah, let me make this remark, because, you see, now, of course, in textbooks, we know that um, massless scalar, massless, uh, massless uh, pseudo-scalar axiom, massless, can be written as, uh, can be dualized into this, okay? So, that, there is no problem here, because if I have Lagrangian, if I start with the Lagrangian, d mu of a square, I can dualize it into the Lagrangian of d mu b alpha beta square, okay? Okay, well, no, no, by, by performing direct duality transformation. Now, then, as far as, this is known, centuries known, okay? Then, the question was, then, yeah, if that's the case, then why can't we just, you know, why we normally don't, take the, into account this possibility that now B can transform as a gauge symmetry of QCD. The point was there was a confusion about that because there were even statements in the literature saying that when the, the, the massive mass generation breaks duality, okay? Somehow it was, um, that's not true. So the mass doesn't break duality, okay? So in other words, at the level of a theory of uh, an axion, I mean, a, a axion, and B, these th two theories, I can dualize into each other, okay? I can do it. However, what you cannot dualize are the explicit breaking terms that come from the peche queen operators. There is no, simply no counter part in B menu language, which would give you the same type of deformation of the theory, okay? And so, and that's why, yeah. Yeah, if you add a three, four, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll go there. So the only possibility would be that I say, yes, maybe I even have transparency. Oh, yeah, yeah, here, yeah, I have a transparency. <laughs> right, sorry. <laughs> yeah, somehow I, I remember it was farther, but yeah. So in other words, the, uh, what this would require, if, for example, how can I, in other words, how can I, I mean, unhix or sort of imitate the explicit breaking of Peche Queen symmetry in case of um, gauge axion? Well, the only possibility is the following. 
you have to postulate that there is an additional three form, let's call it C prime, okay? S somehow, theory is not, QCD cannot give you that because in QCD we don't have it. But there is some hypothetical theory, for example, gravitational chern Simons or whatever, okay? So there is an additional three form uh, which transforms under its own gauge redundancy, okay? And mysteriously, the, the axion that we have introduced for QCD also has the gauge charge under that form. But that, of course, is not a continuous deformation of the theory. The, the, this is a different theory now, in which you are postulating. No, but it's not a question of degrees of freedom. It's about defining gauge properties of the axion. You cannot just arbitrarily, once you specify the gauge proper. What, sorry? No, you can have a the second theory. No, that's, no, no, but what do you mean? <laughs> well, look, I mean, if we do. No, of course, but look, but by the same argument, I can say that, you know, within the standard model, the whatever, gauge charges, the predictions that I'm making gauge charges, those are not predictions because I can deform standard model transformation properties of fermions by some other gauge groups and introduce correspond. I mean, that, that's a deformation. You are, you are considering, you are, so this is a different theory. But the deformation by continuous operators is a completely different story. In Peche Queen, as I said, I mean, in Peche Queen, I, I, all I need to do is just write down some operator which I can deform. I, I don't know what, what you, whatever you want. I mean, like this. I'm not changing any gauge transformation properties or anything like that of the, of the field. Okay, but then let's, let's then, then maybe we have different definitions of what theory means. So theory means, so when I give you degrees of freedom, and they are gauge charges, that's what theory means. Right, but now I'm not changing the degree of freedom. Yeah, you... No, but then you can, then nothing will happen. You have to not just add that degree of freedom. No, it will not, no, you can, for three form to give it a mass, if you just add a three form, sterile, I, if you just add a sterile three form, if you simply, you, you cannot add a three form unless you, 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 you declare that something compensates the gauge shift of that three form. So then you are changing the gauge transformation properties of the axion. I, I just write exactly that, that, that. But that changes the gauge transformation properties of axion. What do you mean you just write that term? If I just write the term, the, the is automatically but that's always automatically, if I introduce additional gauge field and write down coupling of a neutrino with that gauge field, that would be automatically gauge redundant. But that, that I'm changing theory. So I'm saying, this, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a change of a theory. If you are changing a theory by introducing, by, by the way, you are changing the theory dramatically. Uh, no, but I mean, uh, no, but tell me, for example, let's, let's, let, let's do it in, at the level of, okay, may, maybe, Anyway, let me finish this and then let's go to the, the discussion because, they, of course, the, this is very important. So he, here the point, is, the point is that actually you have to postulate additional three form, miraculously that is coming from somewhere, you don't know where, and, uh, and then postulate that the same axion also shifts under this additional three form. Gauge redundant. So you have to completely change the gauge redundancy, the gauge structure of the theory. Okay? Uh, okay, so that's basically the point. So therefore, this is not, of course, this is not possible, by the way, as far as duality is concerned, this is not possible for Peche Queen UV completion. The, the, the formed operators of Peche Queen, they are never reducible to the three form integration in of a three form because again integration out of it in and out of it because of the well first because of locality uh, secondly because integrating out three form you get this uh, integration constant etc etc okay um, so let, let's go now to
No, no, yeah, sorry. This is important. Though. Yeah. So, the point is, you can have consistently a theory in the dual corporation, which is dual to the theory that has an explicit breaking in square by square. So Not really, no. No, you cannot. Because this theory that is written there. Yeah, because it's not a good theory. No, this theory that is written there. So are we asking about so you can have a theory. So the answer is the following. So the, let's first formulate the, what is the question, right? So the question is if I'm asking a following question, can I come up with a new theory in which the gauge axion will not be sufficient to solve the strong CP issue? The answer is yes, there is such a theory. Then it's a theory in which on top of QCD chern simon three form, massless chern simon three, you have additional massless three form in the theory. For example, coming from uh, gravity or something. Yeah, and such that somehow the axion that was intrinsic part of the QCD acquires gauge charge under that three form. Yeah. Yes, of course, but that's a different theory. That's not a continuous deformation of a of a theory. This, I mean, this is important because this is, means that we are changing the, uh, the gauge structure. But the, the second part of the question is the following. Will this theory be dual to a deformed Peche Queen axion? The answer is no. Because whenever you are doing this type of unhixing by a three form, three form always comes with an integration constant which you can ne never have by explicit breaking that comes from local operators of the, of the complex scale. It's just simply not possible, okay? Um, so this, the, the, the integration constant that accompanies a three-form carries the information about the vacuum structure of a three-form theory. So that's another thing. Uh, but, um, but let's come back to the first question because the first, to cl clarifying the first question is, is the most important thing. So, um, now, so in other words, if again, if we don't care about the, I, I don't see how we <laughs> should not care, but if we ignore it, this S matrix, the fact that S matrix requires Minkowski vacuum, okay, if I ignore that, I can do such a thing. Of course, the price to pay for here would be that this will conflict with the S matrix because what this matrix tells me that every sector that comes with the three form should come with its own accompanying axion because otherwise you will always generate vacua which are not in Minkowski and so this, this is incompatible with the S matrix. So if with the S matrix story, what happens is that every time I have a three form, even if I introduce this type of structure, so this means that, um, so, So if I, let's say I have this type of, I have C, a QCD, uh, three form, and then I have some C prime, some other three form, let's say, I don't know, gravity or whatever, okay? Uh, this cannot be a structure because if I have here B, which is linked with the gauge redundancy with C, even if B is linked with gauge redundancy with C prime, there must exist another B prime that is linked with the gauge redundancy with C prime. So in other words, there, there must be another B which takes care of this three form. So in other words, the S matrix formulation is telling me that the number of three forms, number of would be massless three forms, should be exactly equal to number of axions so that the each, there, there are sufficient number of axioms to neutralize uh, each three form, okay? Um, so yeah, so the answer would be that. Now, of course, if you don't care about this S matrix and story, if you only care about this axion, yes, if you, some, if, you, if, you, if you tell me, yes, there is a different sector of the theory, that different sector has a three form correlator, and miraculously, this axion also shifts under that three form correlator, yeah, sure, then of course in that theory, simply you have two, two three forms and one axion and yeah, you, you, the, the theta vacua will be reintroduced, obviously. But again, 
There is a dramatic difference because in that case, this is not a deformation of the theory. We have to introduce the entire new sector of the theory, which somehow gives you this uh, correlator which, which under which axion transforms. So, so for example, I don't know, in, standard, uh, in the standard picture, let's say I have QCD, right? So I have SU3, and let's say I introduce B to, for this theory, okay? For ax standard QCD. Okay, now you can say, sure, I can have some SUN sector with its own theta vacuum, okay? And I don't care about this matrix, who cares whether I, I, I don't have Minkowski or whatever. Yeah, then you will have uh, axion here. And how you imagine this axion coupling to this SUN form, that's the property of the theory. You have to postulate that that is happening. Yes, of course, if you postulate that, the theory will have this gauge redundancy. But you are manufacturing this theory. You are manufacturing a new theory. Yeah, of course, in a new theory, you can have new things. Because you are introducing the whole sector of string theory. And in string theory, by the way, nobody has ever seen massless three form coming from string theory precisely because of this reason. Because usually they are accompanied by. No, that's the case. No, usually they, that's the case. You, can, you will never give me a single example, <laughs> example in which you can tell me, okay, here is a massless a string theoretic example. String theoretic. There are axion like particles. Yeah. 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 Exactly, that's what I'm saying. What do you mean? That's precisely what I'm saying. In string theory, unfortunately, from the string theory, we don't have a candidate for the QCD axis. I mean, is what do you mean to be? I don't understand what you what you what you're saying. Are you saying the same thing that I'm saying? I'm saying I I was telling him. <laughs> I. I <laughs> I was telling him that in string theory, actually nobody managed to really, without, if we put cheating aside, if the, nobody managed to find a candidate. No, but that's, that is a story. Nobody managed to kind, find a candidate, unfortunately, candidate for B menu that would get mass from, that would be good for doing this job for QCD axiom, for QCD. Well, you see, when people, yeah, usually, so, right, usually in our field, when we say, or someone says, or even if I say, that you have infinite number of possibilities, this means that you have none, okay? <laughs> so this is, the, this is the way to cover up when you say, oh, no, why don't, when you, when you tell, okay, you, you ask, okay, give me, yeah, give me precisely one example, and I tell you, no, 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 why do you need one? You can have 1,000. <laughs> then that's the way to, to confuse you, right? So that... So, so therefore, I have no, I don't know any example. No, no, they can couple, but I don't have, and I don't know, and unfortunately, that's not a good, good thing, but unfortunately, I don't know any example, any calculable example in which I can, you know, reliably start to compactify, do this and that, and then here is BMU, and this BMU, is not getting mass from string theoretic effects. From the, it's all, it doesn't have a, its own partner because usually they always have their own partner. Okay, so already they have three forms, their own, and uh, and so they pair up and they, they are massive. So therefore they are not good for doing this job for the for QCD, the jo axiom job. No, the, the problem is, yeah, the problem is, yeah, but the problem is in string theory, okay, so this is, in string theory what happens is that Bs, they come with their own stringy, let's call them C prime, such that this mass generated usually is like string scale or something, so something pretty high. Yeah, yeah, but the coefficient of C prime is generically also an expectation value with Bs, 
Yeah, yeah of course, as you said. Yeah. No, no, it never. No, I've never seen anyone. Okay, let me. Okay, let me. Let me. Let me show. Show, show me your example. I. I. I doubt seriously that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But anyway. Yeah, usually that's what happens, right. No, that's why I'm saying that from string theory, so I'm saying that from string theory, unfortunately, but that's, so unfortunately there are no string theory candidates for the axiom, unfortunately, okay? Um, yeah, the reason is... No, if you imagine, yes, but I mean, okay. it's, it's not. That would be a good candidate. Of course, yeah, then would be a good one. Yes, yes, if you... No, of course. Yeah, of course, if this would be the case, in, but by the way, in string theory, I want to make it very clear, in string theory, this will never happen, because in string theory, string theory is an S matrix theory. There is absolutely no way in string theory to produce it. But let's, let's again put this aside, okay, for a moment. So. Yes, in, in other words, yes, if someone, if, if he convinces me, I, uh, I don't think this will happen, but anyway, so that somehow you, you can manufacture uh, string theory compactification in which you have B menus which are exclusively light, exceptionally light, okay, and couple them to QCD in the right way, yes, then it would be a part, of, it would not solve the strong CP problem, this effect would, will happen, right? So, and then there will be, yes, but I mean, this, of course, you see, I mean, the problem, so here in, in this discussion of Axion, I'm trying to go bottom up, and obviously I cannot rely on unknowns. I'm just saying, if, if I'm, yeah, if I'm, I'm saying that the strong statement, <laughs> I mean, not, the statement is that in string theory, this will never happen. In string theory, every axiom will always come with its own three form, which means that in string theory, at the end of the day, QCD will get some axiom candidate from somewhere, which will be dedicated, dedicated to QCD, okay? And this is what will happen in string theory, or will come with a massless quark or, or so on, and, and so on. But uh, here, I'm not, I'm not discussing unknowns. I'm just saying, if I'm a QCD person, and I'm doing a model building. You know, Peche Queen and Gage Axel. I just, I, I just want to do some model building along different lines. Okay, Peche Queen, they introduce Axion. Okay, they don't, but uh, I mean, they, they introduce. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> we'll check Weinberg, they, they notice, okay, without noticing, they introduce Axion, A. And this Axion then is embedded as a phase of a complex scalar. Okay, so this is this thing, and there, so I, I need a blackboard, but okay. I can I, ah, yeah, great. By the way, this is a very nice way of looking at it because, okay, so let, let's think it the following way, right? Let's, let's think it a la Peche Queen, right? So what was Peche Queen argument originally? When they, they didn't have axion, right? What was the argument? The argument was following. I introduce a U1 symmetry, and I write down theory which is manifestly invariant under U1 symmetry that is anomalous with respect to QCD. Now, this makes them confident that they can avoid the problem. Why? Because they say, look, we now know that in low energies, theta must be unphysical. How do I know that? Because suppose you want to have some theta at low energies. So let's say we have Low en high energy observer, low energy observer. I don't know, Bob and Alice or whatever, okay? So Alice wants to measure certain theta, okay? Whatever value of theta bar. Well, then Bob tells, okay, I can always choose preemptively my phase in such a way to nullify your theta bar, okay? So presumably, therefore, this should be a good solution of the problem. Now, what is the low energy observer? Low energy observer sees this dynamically. Okay, low energy observer says, okay, I mean, Weinberg and Wilczek, whatever. They say, okay, look, there is an axion. This axion enters exactly the same way as theta, okay? 
And so always cancels this effective, the effective theta becomes dynamical, and so always the minimum is where the effective theta is zero, okay? Then there is a third language of a three form, which says, yeah, what happens in reality is that you have a massless three form, and axion makes it massive. That's a, the that's a third way. And now here, there is a sort of a parallel story, which sort of, in certain sense, is like transcendent to, to this. You say, okay, I don't want to think about any of those. I'm just saying, I have QCD with an extremely powerful gauge symmetry. So there is this SU3 gauge symmetry, and I'm simply postulating that there is a degree of freedom that transforms exactly under this SU3 gauge symmetry and under nothing else. And then you are done in this, so in this parallel discussion. Now, of course, the, the, now the point is you can always change a theory to get a different outcome. The question is we need some criterion. You guys are not listening, really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, but, no, but we need some, we have to come up with some criteria of the expense. In other words, you see, what it takes to change the theory in such a way to get new outcome, right? We need somehow to quantify. Otherwise, of course, you, we can always write something which gives. And so, now, my criterion is I'm, I'm saying, gauge structure, watch, once I specify the gauge, gauge structure, that's what defines the theory. Okay, now, may, may it happen that this gauge structure is never supported by some fundamental theory? Yes, of course, it may happen. How can I, how can I exclude unknowns? That that's obviously is the case. Um, but I'm not there because I, I don't know how to do it from whatever fundamental theory. And therefore I'm saying, okay, look, let me be extremely, extremely modest. Let me just say, this gauge structure defines my theory, period. So can I deform theory without deforming this gauge structure to get, and the answer is no. That, that, that's what I'm saying. The, the rest is a question of, okay, so it's quant, I mean, question of, of definitions. Yeah. So regarding this point, what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that this is a limitation of the dual formulation that there, therefore you just cannot describe the theories that have an explicit specific breaking, or are you also concluding that as a consequence these theories are not valid? Which theories? The ones that Yeah. Which theories? The theory that you wrote before you say queen that you add a term, an extra term that breaks explicitly the definition. Yeah, so in other words, I'm saying so I'm, I'm saying so I'm making two two statements, like like uh, let's call it strong motivation and, and, and weak uh, strong criterion and weak criterion. Uh, so the strong criterion as I said, strong criterion is that I stick to S matrix, and then I only tolerate Minkowski vacua. In this case, there, is, there are no questions asked. In this case, theory imposes on you that you must have axion with exact shift symmetry modulo QCD anomaly. Okay, now, therefore, here, the, the gauge formulation comes as a understanding how this could happen. Because naively you would say, okay, look, uh, strong CP problem, yeah, I mean, S matrix doesn't like the, the non Minkowski vacua, sure. And it would be perfectly fine if you have, miraculously, you have Peche Queen with global symmetry, undef undeformable. I, of course, again, I cannot exclude miracles. But what I'm saying is that in this light, to have Peche Queen with all these operators, explicit breaking operators, to all orders being zero, for me would require some underlying explanation. And underlying explanation, I'm saying, well, is provided by this. Because 
the, as Matrix tells me, well, yes, every three form comes with a BMU mu field, gauge redundancy, and that's it. You cannot do anything with the theory, okay? So this would be the strong, my strong formulation, okay? Right, now, now, if, okay, if we take this point of view that tomorrow someone will come up with known as matrix theory of gravity, okay? By the way, I don't think that will happen, but okay, we, 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 can, we, we, can, we can improvise. Then, then I would say weak, then for, I would stick to weak criterion. Yes, if you tell me that I should not think about this matrix, whatever. Yes, then I'm providing an A example of axion, which has no quality which nullifies the quality issue, okay? So, now, of course, even here you can always tell me, yes, but how you can di distinguish your formulation from peche Queen formulation with arbitrarily small deformation? Of course I cannot, obviously. I mean, that's, that, that is, um, yeah, obviously I, I cannot. It's just I'm saying, that, but here we have to be reasonable. We are comparing a formulation that has underlying gauge principle, which tells you, with some good luck, okay? Obviously, you can always have good luck in, in, in ordinary formulation and, and, de and deform, uh, accidentally deform theory too weakly. In the, uh, you're not required to know the answer to this question, but if you know, <laughs> it would be interesting. In the old paper, uh, I published in the Zing and uh, uh, Right. that you might know. Well, they started from a Initial same idea. They said, oh, if, if I have a gauge, yeah, exactly. That's right. Right. Probably, yeah. I'm protected. Right. But the conclusion is uh, opposite your. Yeah, because then they said, let's abandon. Because they abandoned. They said exactly. They said, oh, it would be nice to have this gauge formulation, but unfortunately, axiom potential cannot be dualized, which is absolutely wrong. Axiom, I showed that precisely that, that axiom potential is perfectly dualized because they missed this point that you, you dualization happens through a three form. So this is what, they don't discuss massive three form. That's the whole point. You see, they, of course, these people are obviously, they know a lot and they, they are very smart. They somehow intrinsically, when they do computations, probably this, you know, if, because then they go to Polyakov analogy with some Poly, Polyakov two dimensional and this kind of stuff. But the key point was missed there that, yes, there is a duality between B mu nu and A, at the level of B mu nu and A, if you don't care about embedding in Peche Queen, you can always dualize using the three form. And so that's why the axiom potential, arbitrary axiom potential, can be described by a B mu nu theory or by A theory. So, yeah, this is, this is the key difference. Well, okay, so now this, this most non-rigorous part in that paper is this wormhole potent because these wormholes on its own, I mean, th there is a huge set of problems with wormholes because, they, okay, the bottom line is that they, they most likely they don't exist, these wormholes. In order to stabilize them, you need negative energies to violate energy conditions and then you, once you enter this game of violating energy conditions and this and that, you don't know where this thing is coming from. And usually these computations are plausible. You never compute coefficients exactly, which can be happily zero. So this, 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 uh, this uh, statements that wormholes really contribute to this correlator to, to whatever, to B mu, B mu or whatever. Okay, that I would, that I would, I would, I, I don't want to enter there because I don't think that is the case. Okay, uh, by the way, unfortunately, because again, it's the same thing. Um, for instance, the, there is, the open question whether the gravitational topological susceptibility is non zero. Okay. So there are no instantons with, with, with right quantum numbers. Now, my point is that probably this is non zero, and the reason is that there is a black hole tower. And so if you insert black hole tower here, uh, the of course, again, I, we cannot com really compute this, but 
The expression looks very similar to uh, the Vidal Veneziano story with global tower contributing into the topological susceptibility of QCD. So, so it looks like that black holes probably contribute into, into, into this correlator. Okay, probably, but, but that's a separate question. So I don't think wormholes do, uh, because you need, need to make as many assumptions about wormholes and so yeah. So yeah, so that part is, is there, but the, the, the key difference is this, but that's why they didn't pursue this, because obviously otherwise, if, if, the, if in this language, wormholes can undo QCD story, this would mean that the wormholes give you this correlator Okay, with the same quantum numbers of B menu. That B menu must also shift under the same transformation. Why? Why should it shift under the same transformation? If I start with a theory in which B menu has no gauge charge with respect to gravitational chern Simons, there is no way in the universe Warhol or whoever can endow it with gauge charge. That's not possible. Gauge charges are not, you, you cannot, you cannot make, make something gauge transform when it does not, okay? So, no, this is, yeah, preemptively if you think that, yes, the wormholes contribute and they maybe, maybe they can contribute, yeah, then yes, you should, you should, you, in my language that would be wormholes providing additional, an initial three form under which the same QCD axion shifts. Yeah, that's what it would be, but... Yeah, absolutely. You mean, so you mean to, to have, um, so let, let's be more precise. Like, let's say we have, so. Okay, yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, if you, so you, you start with such a theory, you want to start with such a theory. Of course, yes. As, this was uh, as a, a dual Absolutely, yes, yes. Exactly. And, yeah. and this way, you can also do it. Uh, I would say you can, okay, you were complaining that the explicit phase sequence breaking that we have with this new square, you can make it small and continuously deforming. Yeah, right. Here you can do exactly the same. Right? How? No, but I don't say what this because there are too many things. You are you are jumping over too many things. So you want to do the following thing: a, SU3 color, and then I have additional SU n whatever Higgs down to nothing. Okay, all right. And I have constraints instantons here. So now now we're making first assumption. First assumption is that I have axion. So you want to go with 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 this formulation. I have given you axion that is transforming under this symmetry but also under this symmetry. But then you are on the square one, then, I'm, then you are changing a theory in which you are postulating a different gauge structure. Yes. Yeah, of course, then you can do whatever, I mean, again, this is not a deformation of the theory, this is you are introducing now, you are saying, what if axion not only transforms under SU3, but transforms under something else? But that's not a continuous deformation of the theory. No, but you need to trans you need this axion to shift under this gauge transformation. There's, there is no, no low high energy. There is a well-defined gauge transformation under which the beam menu has to shift, period. That's a, this, that's, that. If the two groups were, yes, absolutely. If they are unified, yeah, absolutely, yes. In that case, yeah, there is no problem. In fact, if they are unified, then one axion would solve both, both, both strong C group. Yeah, but then, then there would be no problem. It, the, the if they are not unified, you can have axion effect dual of one kind, of color, and axion effect dual of the other. Obviously, you can have it, but that's not a deformation of the theory. That you are, from the beginning, you are introducing a theory which has different features. But of course, you can always write some theory and get some answer. I mean, that. <laughs> 
What, what, yeah, like what? What's the contingent deformation? From which con? Well, yes, sure. I mean, yeah. If you, if you, if that's what you want to say, that okay, I introduce this SUN. Okay, please, yeah. So you say the gauge coupling of this, I take, I take it to zero, and uh, yeah, somehow, okay. One has to be careful because this BMU new still has to shift under this symmetry, no matter what. And as you, as you, as you know, the, okay, decoupling gauge groups is a little bit something, a little bit fishy. But, um, but uh, yeah, okay, if you do something like that, but again, this is not, sure, you can, but <laughs> here you are coming from, because the transformations are like one over G. You are coming, essentially you are coming from infinity. You are coming from the point where something is infinite and you are bringing something, yeah, I mean. No, but I, I agree that. Sure. If you don't do the S2N, then you are done. I mean, what you understand that the quality problem is that, Right, exactly. Right. 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 The issue would be if with S3 and BMU, gravity unavoidably would generate a mass to the normal gravitation. Mass to the normal BMU. Right. According to here, this cannot happen unless you do something specific. Exactly. So now there is one. Right, right. No, but I, I think black hole, the virtual black hole, right. Black holes are more, more reliable in that sense, okay? Because wormholes, as I said, they don't really exist, and black holes, they do. Um, but, and so black hole tower is probably something contributing there. So now, by the way, the, the interesting, there is an interesting thing, so a little bit, a little bit on, a, on a different note. We lost already part of the audience. <laughs> It <laughs> into, into a bubble, but <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's okay. So um, the there is an interesting possibility, actually. Um, so okay, either if you take this S matrix as motivation, whatever motivation. So if I introduce this correlator somehow, actually, it's very interesting. This correlator can be neutralized by neutrinos because. The point is that the, there is, since the, its gravity is universal, there, there is a chiral symmetry that is anomalous with respect to gravity, and all the fermions transform under this chiral, chiral symmetry, and actually, in particular, also neutrinos. And uh, there is an interesting possibility that if one of the neutrinos were massless at the, let's call it, tree level, then by doing chiral transformation, so, yeah, by the way, here it's described, so we have this uh, gravitational topological susceptibility, let's say, okay, in pure gravity. And uh, so by chiral neutrino transformation, uh, you, you neutralize it. And so what happens is that uh, as a result you know, of that effect, this neutrino gets a mass, okay? Just, it's very similar to how the up quark gets a mass if it, when it neutralizes the, the topological susceptibility of, of QCD. So we even speculated with uh, Lena Funke uh, whether, okay, this could be an interesting unexplored contribution to the neutrino mass through the gravitational topological susceptibility of gravity. Um, so yes, so in other words, now for, as again, as I'm saying, in the strong case of S matrix, this is a must. You cannot have any unaccompanied topological susceptibility anywhere in the theory, okay? So then prediction is that, yes, everywhere, okay? Um, so all, all the sectors must be neutralized either by axion or by massless quarks. By the way, that's one way of, okay, I don't want to enter now in string theory discussions, but you know, one, one of the main, main things in string theory is that we don't know how to derive standard model. We know how to derive standard model like uh, supersymmetric mostly theories. But uh, so that's another way how supersymmetry, of course, trivially solves the, the problem. It solves the problem by, in supersymmetric standard model uh, in, with unbroken supersymmetry, uh, of course, there is no strong CP problem because gluinos, gluinos are massless. Okay, 
And so there's, there's, so probably if you, I mean, as far as string theory is concerned, probably the version of string theory that we know today is not the, is not the, the final one that probably can give standard model and stuff. And then the final one most likely will deliver this BMU designated axiom for, for, for QCD, so, right. Um, I don't know if I, uh, yeah, this <laughs> Yeah, please. If I take n equals four super young mills? No, no, I meant like if, if we come closest, we can come down to this MSSM or something. Is like MSSM like thing with a bunch of other things and unbroken super symmetry with massless gluinos. And of course, if gluino is massless, then you don't, you don't have theta. You don't have theta term. That's what I meant. I don't know, n equals four, what is happening in n equals four? Remind me. No, but you mean in stringy n equals four or just n equals four? No, but the, the, the one that you, you comes from the stringy compactification? Yeah, and then what is happening there? Yeah, yeah, of course. The, No, but I mean, I don't understand. How can the, the gauge fields are massless? Sorry, the gluinos are massless. So how can there be a, a, a theta vacuum if gluinos are massless? So I mean, they are No, no, wait a minute. I don't understand the previous statement first. Let's go to the... So, so what, what do you mean it's not anomalous? Uh, yeah. You could pick normally it allows you to remove the tank, but it's not anomaly. It happens. Okay. And so that's why theta is uh, typical and it could be close to the But how 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 does that no but that's where no, but that's something is confusing How how that is also because Well I see that this part of the issue is No, I don't say I mean if there is a fermion, Cairo, if there is a fermion No, no, I'm saying if there is a fermion in the, in the theory, which is massless, I can always define a, a rotation that will touch the... There is a Yukawa, there is a Yukawa that don't allow you to do that rotation. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, with, with gluinos, Yukawa doesn't allow you. Yeah. With gluinos. Yeah. Gluinos have Yukawas? Yeah, too? because it's all in their job. So there is a, a couplet of... Uh, to the scalar, which is also a job. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I mean if, if you can Aye, because you. Asymmetry is SU4. Yeah. So the only diagonal pieces are not like this. No, but he's asking why I cannot just rotate by one thing. Maybe the way you can rotate. Uh, no, no, probably he's right. Probably, probably the answer is that uh, probably there are you covers that prevent you from that. So it's explicitly broken, basically. So you are saying in n equals four, anomalous part is explicitly broken. Okay. Yeah. No, no, when I said supersymmetry, I meant in poor MSSM, whatever, massless MSSM and stuff. I didn't mean something very deep. But, um, but yeah, for... for uh, yeah, of course, we like, we like philosophy. So, how for you? Uh-huh. If you believe that the axis are evolved, shouldn't the mass of the applicant be used? Mass of what? Yeah, I mean, I well, I I agree. Uh, well, I agree, but that would be wrong. But that would belong to this miraculous case because you see the 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 gauge axion, as I said, because up, yes, if up is so so in order for up to work, absolutely correct. Up the mass, he, he means like mass of the up quark to be zero, right? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. So the simplest would be to have uh, up quark with zero Yukawa coupling. But of course, you, you, that's not sufficient. You have to forbid all possible high dimensional operators. So yes, if you are saying up quark has zero Yukawa coupling and also there are no high dimensional operators, uh, yes, that, that sure, that would work. But uh, perhaps the answer is that because this would also require this to, to all possible high dimensional operators to vanish, Therefore, yeah, therefore, maybe system prefers to have gauge axion rather than, rather than up quark. But I mean, I'm perfectly happy with up quark, except it doesn't work, unfortunately. Yeah. No, absolutely, because the up quark would mean that the. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the other way around. You should make you more confident. <laughs> no, but let me explain why. No, this is important because you see, the, the point is this, right? The, the, we some, 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 we, some, somehow we often forget that there is a direct experimental evidence of the theta vacua, and that's the mass of eta prime. That's the beautiful thing that eta prime, essentially eta prime mass, is literally coming from the theta vacuum structure of the theory. So there is no question that theta vacuum exists, right? So therefore, the reason, so the only reason why theta prime is not a good axion is because up quark has a little mass. Now, so mu is non-zero, right? But otherwise, every time we excite theta prime, we are exciting this precisely the same vacuum structure. So to me, this makes me even more confident that axion exists because you see nature already showed us that there is such a structure, except it's a little bit doesn't work because of mass of the up quark. But the entire structure is there. So I don't know, I take it in the opposite way as you. So you take it as a... Well, I don't view it, yes, no, I don't view it in that way. I view that nature showed us that the mechanism is there. But again, if the mass was zero, you would not be living there. Right, then you would have it. Right. Uh, yes, so the mass of the axiom. Well, um, but um, again, this is this is the no, but this is the this is this is precisely the philosophical problem because it's like I don't know half empty or half because. The two, yeah, the eta prime, this realization that the eta prime is literally an axion, except it doesn't work, right, as an axion, because of this slight mismatch. So it has the same structure. Now this tells you, nature tells you that this mechanism is there in nature, right? We know that this axion relaxation, something like very similar to axion relaxation mechanism is there in nature, okay. Maybe perhaps this is precisely the indication that the, the up quark mass being non-zero, that, that's, and the reason is that also all possible high dimensional operators would have been non-zero. Maybe that's an indication that indeed axion, the true axion is coming from the gauge sector. Some, some, so it's a gauge, should be a gauge part of the symmetry. Maybe that's the indication. But in any case, I mean, as I, as I said, I, I take this, yeah, I take this, uh, yeah, indication. Precisely. By the way, one more thing about this, um, the, the, the three-form story, right? Um, now, in three-form, there is the following uh, interesting uh, effect. So le let's, let's introduce a three-form. Fundamental, for example, it doesn't have to be the QCD three-form. And we write the Lagrangian, right? And say so there is axion coupled to uh, E, and then da square, right? And now you see what is happening here. In this Lagrangian, there is a there is a global symmetry, shift symmetry, right? Okay, by a constant. 
In other words, the, the theory shifts um, by total derivative because this is a total derivative. So the Lagrangian shifts by total derivative. So the equations of motion of this theory, as I said, they are actually d mu, d mu of E is equal to dA, and then box A plus E equals zero. And then you can integrate this out. Some constant, so this integration constant. Actually, we can call it kappa or something. Okay, and now if I plug it there, here, So naively, I would, I would get the following story, right? So naively, I would say, OK, so there was this shift symmetry up to a total derivative. So in other words, equations of motion were uh, shift invariant to start with, right? And uh, so normally, we know that if theory is at least in bilinear theory, we can int the integration out can be exact, right? And somehow, miraculously, I got a theory in which no, I no longer have the shift symmetry, OK? So the, the, that's pre, the, the point precisely, that the information about this is coming with this integration constant kappa. And somehow, what we need to do, we have to attribute this shift symmetry by a constant to this kappa, okay? So it's very strange. It looks very strange. There is some kind of a uh, Stuckelberg, like integration, which is constant, dead constant, a but transforms under the symmetry, okay? So some kind of a uh, story like that. But there is this peculiarity in, in three form integration and that's why, so in other words, you see, you, you, you generate mass for a scalar in this way, but if you try to do the same thing from some explicit breaking operators in a local theory in which scalar is a Goldstone boson, you cannot, you don't have this peculiarity about the shift symmetry. And so there is a difference. So in other words, even here already at this level, without any gauge symmetry and sophistication, there is this difference that three form is not just like some kind of a dead constant that you are introducing back and forth. Uh, also the fact that it, it's, it's CP odd, that also, also tells you that. So it, it, it is a very important object. You mean experimentally at low energies? Yes. Yeah. Well, at low energies, if, so also not considering cosmology and things like that. Because they are. No, because this is why is this important? Because you see, the in effective field theory, B mu nu, UV completion of B mu nu within the renormalizable field theory doesn't exist. Okay, so from that point of view, this is very important. So if you want to stay within the effective theory, okay, then you are bound to the situation that, for example, inflationary scale cannot exceed the scale of B mu nu and so on. So there are very important restrictions on cosmology and stuff like this, right? Now, uh, Can you repeat the argument about the scale of inflation? Yeah, so let me, let me. Um, so, so FA uh, for uh, Pechequin axion, right? Ah, oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> so uh, let's consider PQ axion, right? So here's PQ, and that, so there is a scale. And there is this cut, cut off of gravity, okay? Because for inflation, gravity is important. So whatever this the scale of gravity, let me call it mg, right? Now, uh, here in, in Pache Queen, um, the only restriction on cosmologically on the scale of inflation is that the scale of inflation should not exist, exceed the uh, gravitational cutoff, okay? So this is the restriction. So scale of inflation, let's call it, I don't know, M inflation. M inflation has to be less than M gravity. Okay, so this is the only restriction. And so in Peche Queen, in principle, you can have a scenario in which 
during inflation, symmetry is restored, uh, Pacheco symmetry is restored, or whether it's broken, and so on. You can have different possibilities here. Now, in gauge axion, in gauge axion, Fa cannot be below M gravity scale. Be, why? Because no renormalizable UV completion exists for BMU nu axion, okay? Right? And correspondingly, FA for B mu axion is also a cutoff of the effective field theory, okay? And because of that, inflationary scale now here is restricted to be below FA, okay? And so, of course, this is a substantial. Yeah, Hubble is the most conservative one is the Hubble, yeah. Well, it's, it's a constraint, it's not a prediction. Yeah, yeah, everything. Oh, yeah, reheating temperature also, absolutely. T reheating, thank you, Michele. Yeah, T reheating is also below the axion scale. Sorry, but the point is that you don't know how to compute when the inflation is above FA, or you're saying that the theory is not consistent. Yeah, so in other words, uh, he, he's, this is similar. When we, when we discuss uh, inflation, uh, story is a little bit similar to uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis in the following sense, right? Um, we know that within the theory that we can compute, Big Bang nucleosynthesis looks extremely, I mean, works extremely well. So that's why usually we don't try to introduce any physics that would mess up the standard computation, right? Now, of course, we cannot rule out that there is some completely exotic theory in which nucleosynthesis is still works as it is, but you know, it's affected. But usually in cosmology, we try to, the things that we can compute within certain framework, we try to not to affect that framework, okay? Now, the similar story is in inflation, right? So inflation, we say, when we do inflationary computations, we assume that we are in effective field theory below the gravity scale, okay? And then we do, for example, we calculate gravitational waves, we calculate uh, whatever density perturbations and stuff. And those are the ones that then we try to sort of measure, right? So in inflation, we always use this constraint. This is inflationary constraint intrinsically. Now, not because, of course, tomorrow maybe if we do inflation in, 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 in trans-Planckian theory or something, maybe it works fine. But the, the difference is that we don't know how to compute there, and where we have computing and it works, we prefer not to touch it. Okay, so this is the philosophy. So that's why, yeah, that's the philosophy. So in other words, we don't want to enter the regime in which effective field theory no longer works. So that's, yeah, of course, it also applies here, right, right. So if we take this point of view, which is conservative, but it's, I think it's, it's, it's extremely reasonable, that the, the, those computations that, that were successful, we don't want to undo them. So then, yes, then you have this restriction, okay? No, 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 this has nothing to do with the metrics. This is always true, this is regardless. No, this is, uh, uh, this is even more, more conservative than the S metrics because, uh, yeah, this is simply, we don't want to enter the regimes where standard computations were not been done. And so the, the, we want to trust them and therefore we don't want to make inflation to be beyond effective field theory regime. Yeah. Yeah, so then there, 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 yeah, that's why I, was start, I started this, right. So now this concerns, for example, the structure of topological defects and, and uh, so uh, axion strings and axion domain walls and this kind of stuff. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. So then, yeah, because the, the, if inflation always happened below the scale FA, they are not, there is no string network. If there were pre-existing ones, they got inflated away, okay? Now, um, Yeah, there you form strings, strings. Yeah, and yeah, you form strings. Right. Right. No, but the deep brain inflation is precisely an example of inflation which you do within string theory. Yeah. So yeah, there if you if you know how to do it, then yes, but I mean that's that's the 
By the way, not talking about problems of <laughs> deep brain inflation and inflation in general in string theory. That's a separate, <laughs> that's a topic of separate lecture. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think that's so. No, well, your, your comment is so. Let me just to, to reiterate. So, what Michele is saying, Michele says that there are examples of inflationary scenarios in which you are you are managing to go beyond this, okay, or at least beyond this somehow. Yeah, I mean, if you know how to go beyond that, okay. Sure, you can do it. I mean, by the way, uh, okay, this deep brain, I was one of the people that proposed this, so, and I have right to criticize it, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's a whole separate story, problems there, okay. You, you mean uh, here? Yeah. No, I, I don't think F is so high because the, the okay, so there are two things, right? So first, uh, since this is the scenario, okay, so two, two, two answers to the question. So, I mean, question has two parts. So first thing is that um, the uh, M, M gravity scale, and what do we know about gravity scale, okay? Now, what we know about gravity scale, for sure, is the following thing. So first of all, gravity scale uh, depends on the number of degrees of freedom that you have in the theory, okay? And as Michele and I said so some time ago, uh, advocated this, this thing. Uh, actually, a gravity scale has to be above, sorry, has to be below uh, Planck scale divided by number of species, okay? For example, cosmological arguments, we had some, several arguments. Uh, black holes are there also and so on. Anyway, so this is a pretty robust non-perturbative bound, okay? Has nothing to do with perturbation theory. Now, in the standard model, the number of species we have is approximately 120, okay? So this means that somehow, conservatively, we know that like M Planck divided by 10 is the upper bound on uh, scale of gravity. Now, on top of that, we don't know much because the principle could be sufficiently low, okay, and, and so on. So, therefore, we cannot really claim that they, so what, in other words, yeah, if I translate this as a, as a constraint on a decay constant of axion, is that, yes, axion decay constant has to be, so for sure, has to be below uh, M Planck, uh, like uh, one-tenth of M Planck or something. Um, Beyond that, okay, it's 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 hard to it's hard to hard to know. Now, secondly, secondly, uh, second point is that so in this theory, in, with this constraint, effectively, this means that since you are doing inflation and reheating below the scale, okay, you are always in the phase where you have axion axion effective theory. So you are always in axion effective theory throughout the inflation. Now, in throughout in that case. Actually, there is not really any st strong bound on FA because of the following reason, that uh, we don't know what was the QCD scale during inflation. I, I wrote this paper uh, centuries ago uh, that, uh, yeah, pointing this out. And uh, yeah, there, there, there were some explicit, even my student wrote recently, Emmanuel, he, he, he checked it more, more carefully. So, yeah, in general, it's, it's true. So, since the QCD scale depends on fields, okay, um, there is absolutely no reason to assume that the QCD scale during inflation was the same as it is today. So, during inflation, QCD, scale, QCD could have been strong, okay, which would mean that during inflation, already the axiom started oscillations and uh, so got diluted. And, and therefore, so, yes, in so I would say the following thing, even within most con standard thing, even if I forget, once you have inflation, the, there is not really a upper bound on the axion scale because we don't know what was happening during inflation. So it's perfectly fine that axion is, is much, much heavier than the standard, uh, standard sorry, much lighter than the standard window. So from that point of view.
Yeah. So these are these two things then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, Divinu on its own, the field is well known. It's a so-called Kalbramon field. It's a two, two anti-symmetric two form. And as you absolutely correctly noticed, Divinu uh, comes from the open string spectrum. In string theory, there is the so-called modern independent Divinu. Yeah, I'm, but I'm not considering that B mu nu. I mean, B mu nu can be whatever. But B mu nu, so there is the in string theory, as you said correctly, and model independent B mu nu. Yeah, you can, yeah, as I said, if you have the theory of B mu nu, which is, you can. Yeah, but the, the, string, the model independent BMU nu can get mass from the other sources. This is what we were discussing before. Because the, then it cannot serve as a QCD axiom. Yeah, yeah. If, if BMU nu is charged under the QCD three form, then yes, absolutely. BMU nu will couple to the, yeah, it will have coupling. No, but the problem is that B mu nu, if, if we are talking about string theory, B mu, the one that is model independent, the one of, that comes from the closed strings, right? Usually that gets contribution from the other sources into the mass, not just QCD. So yes, if you postulate that the QCD is the only source for that B mu nu mass, yes, then absolutely correct, yeah. Exactly, that's the problem. The problem is that it usually charged under many, many things, Yeah. Yeah. But then you have to generate it in string theory. I mean, so if we are talking about string construction, Okay, let's go, let's go step by step because you, we, have, we have jumped over several things. So, so, the, the, so if you have B mu nu, which has no other source of the potential, you can dualize it into axion. There's no problem with that. Okay, but that, now, but you are assuming that there are no other sources into the potential of the axion. Okay, so now, therefore, let's stay within B mu, let's stay within B mu formulation. So within B mu formulation, we have C plus DB squared. This is the coupling, right? Now you want to add what, what, which operator to this? Within QCD, you cannot add anything that would destabilize this. Like what? What, what, is the, what, what would be the operator? Sorry, what? Yeah, but you should tell me more. So what, what is the structure? What is the structure of the operator? So let's write it uh, basically in terms of the uh, Okay, so A E is the G right? Okay, so G menu. Uh, okay, G menu, fine. Right? Okay. Then Yeah, okay, let's write, write it. Okay, now trans let's run, but now we have to translate this in the language of C, right? This is gauge invariant. Yeah, yeah, if it's gauge if it's gauge invariant, it should reduce uh, either to 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 the field strength of C or some kind of a high order high dimensional operator. So for example, you can add to this arbitrary 
high dimensional operators of, of C that would, for example, this could, for example, contribute into the K function. No problem, I mean, but as long as the, you, you, you can see immediately that by gauge redundancy, there, there is no way to unhix this. I mean, E again will be zero, like electric field of E will be zero because of, because of gauge, gauge redundancy. So, for, because that's true for arbitrary form of the operator. It, any operator that is expressible, yeah. any operator that you can add to this theory will maintain the, that E is zero in the vacuum. Yeah, of course, you can add the term. Yeah, you can add the term, no problem. If we dualize this theory, we get... No, but if you dualize and then, so let's go, this is the same, this is a contribution to here. So this is arbitrary, K. Right, I think, yeah, so you can dualize the theory in terms of... I'm sorry, this is not the question. This is a discussion. Right, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, how can, uh, so what I don't understand is that how, how, how dualizing back and forth can help you? Unless, the, because the, the, yes, uh, you can dualize this to an axion. This will be an axion with this potential. Yeah, and then it's always, so in other words, unless you generate something that is, corresponds to an explicit breaking, because anything that couples axion to E, anything that couples axion to E is dualizable in this form. Unless you add explicit breaking, unless you add some term which, which includes axion that you know, has a different structure, that will not be dualizable into, into this with, with form C. So therefore, if you are starting from this description, by default you are landing on E equals zero. There is no way to generate anything which, in which E is non-zero. Uh, yeah. So his point. So Romain, if I understood correctly, so what what the question was is that somehow if I have this operator, which is whatever CP violating operator. So in other words, the point here is that let's start with this theory and add whatever CP violating operators you want. Okay. So the question is whether those whatever CP violating operators you you add whether they will generate non-zero E. Right. And the answer is they cannot, by, by structure, it's obvious, because you, I let you do arbitrary K of E, okay? Whatever you want, right here, whatever you want. That's it, so the, the mod, modifying theory just simply by the Lagrangian of E is, it guarantees that E is equal to zero in the, in the, in the Which, which particular probability? In string theory with model dependent action. You can consider that string theory axion B is charged under a few three gauge only. But this But then don't call it a don't call it a model independent action. If we are discussing string theoretic model independent action, yeah, yeah. that action we should consider as, as it is. We cannot improvise. That action is charged not under QCD, but all possible gauge groups. It interacts with everyone. Plus it inter it also has at certain three forms that couple to it. So it's a mess. So that is a theory with uh, axion and yeah. So that axion, unfortunately, cannot do job for QCD. So therefore, I would suggest to simplify the question. And let's, instead of motivating this from model dependent axion, let's, because your question has nothing to do with model independent axion. Your question is very simple. You are saying, suppose I have this theory. What if I add some new CP violating operators? Uh, the answer is, that you can add whatever you want to the theory. The, in the vacuum, because C is massive, okay, in the vacuum, the electric field has to be zero. Because massive free form cannot have a non-zero field strength in the vacuum. That's not possible, right? So that's the answer. Now, if we can discuss in more technical terms, 
I mean, or whatever, later or, or, or now, it's fine, but it's, 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 this is precisely the point. It's straightforward to see. So, therefore... Yeah, so we, we can talk about it. Because the CP violation is not sourcing and field strength. It is, you can only source a field, not the field strength. The fact that you are sourcing a field strength doesn't mean that field strength is non zero. If I, if you see, because you are not doing variation with respect to field strength, you are doing variation with respect to the field. And in the field strength, field enters with derivative. And that's why, the, the, I mean, you, that, you, you don't generate a source. You, know, you see, if, if I write a term which is theta e, this looks like a source for e, but it's not. Because you don't do variation of the theory with respect to e, you do variation with respect to c. That's why this doesn't contribute into the equations of motion, because it's a total derivative. So you can add whatever source with total derivative you want, it will not induce any field. Because again, total derivative doesn't affect the equations of motion. That's another way to see it, right? So this, this, this is precisely the point. Yeah, the key, yeah. Listen, I, I would say this has been a very interesting talk and very amusing also opportunity for discussion. I don't want to explore too much uh, Gia because I also asked uh, Gia to give on Wednesday a discussion about uh, uh, the, you remember some of you that was uh, here the past week, we had uh, Choi, Kivun Choi, mm -hmm. talking about uh, uh, the inversion of the limit uh, in uh, uh, the uh, instant on computation for theta. And uh, uh, also, also Gia has uh, something to say about that. So Wednesday at 11, uh, we will put this in, in, in the page, we will have again a talk and uh, Gia will tell us uh, his opinion about, uh, about that paper. Yeah. So thank you Gia very much. Well, thank you.